A computer program is a list of instructions that can be followed by a computer to perform a specific task. Most programs work by taking some input data, processing that, and creating some output data. Understanding the values and types will form a foundation on top of which we can build up concepts that will allow us to write our own programs. So values are the actual underlying raw numbers and text our program manipulates. Tony Stark, the number 43, and false are all examples of values. Sometimes we'll say that when we literally write the number four and then the number three next to each other to form the number 43, that we're writing the literal 43. Same with Tony Stark. If we write the quotes, then the letters T, O, N, Y, etc., into our code, we'd say that we're using the string literal Tony Stark. Sometimes we might say that this is hard-coded, meaning that when the program runs, the literal value isn't going to change. Literal values are used a lot when you're first starting out, but eventually data will likely come from a database or some user input. Every value belongs to exactly one data type. The kinds of values that can be represented and manipulated in a programming language are known as types. All of these literals that we've written so far can be categorized as a specific type. We see string, number, and boolean. Those are the types for Tony Stark, 43, and false. Most languages use a very similar list of super simple types, like a collection of characters as a string of text, a list of digits with or without a decimal point as a number, and then some type for representing true and false. Some programming languages will have more types that they have built in. Other programming languages will have a very small set of these primitive built-in types that you are to use to build up to more complex types. When a program needs to use a value again in the future, it assigns that value or sort of like stores that value in a variable. Variables have names and they allow us to use those names in our programs to refer back to the values. We'll talk more about variables later. Here we're assigning the value seven a name age. We're also assigning the string Grayson to the variable name first name. If we wanted to print out the value seven using the variable age, we might call some print function and pass in the variable name or the literal number seven. And we'll take a look at how to print out the number or the string or whatever value it is in different programming languages. There's really two different kinds of types. There are built-in types, and then there are user-defined types. Built-in types are the types that come with the language. This is the batteries included stuff like numbers and strings and dates and arrays and object types. User-defined data types are defined in terms of built-in data types and other user-defined data types. Here, we're defining a student type or we have defined a user-defined type called a student type, which is composed of or made up of other built-in types, the number for the, the age and the string for the first name. We might also create a car type, which takes in a make and a model, both of which might also be user-defined types. Typically, a programming language does not let the programmer extend or redefine those built-in types. Next, a type can either be mutable or immutable. These primitive types like seven and true are immutable, meaning they cannot change. You can change the value of the variable, meaning you can change what the name of that variable is referencing by pointing the variable at a different value. However, there's no way to change what the number seven means. When we talk about the number seven, there's no way we can like modify the number seven to be the number eight or the number six. We wouldn't want to change what the number seven means. Similarly with true, we wouldn't want to change what it means for something to be true. A mutable object can change. Here we have an array or a list, 
and this list has four values. It has 9, 10, 9, and 11. These might be ages or these might be other values, but the, the underlying type for this collection of values is called a list. A list or an array in some languages can change. All right, today we're using REPL to run some of our JavaScript code. On the right-hand side, we have the terminal output window. In the middle, we have our editor. We're, we're modifying the index.js file today, and we have line one. Right now, there is no code uh, in our uh, index.js file, so when we run the code, nothing is going to output, uh, and that's fine. The very first thing I want to do is talk about how we can create some output. How can we make something show up in the terminal? So in, in JavaScript, we do that using a, uh, a method on the console called console.log. So we type out the word console, followed by a period, and then the word log, and then we have an opening and closing, opening and closing parentheses. And inside of those, we can put in whatever we want to actually print out to the console. So in this case, if we just put the number one and click run, we will see the output of number one in the console. The next thing I wanna talk about is adding comments to your code. In JavaScript, we can add a comment by prefixing a line or prefixing the comment with slash slash. Comments are generally used to describe bits of your code and to make it easier for you to remember what code is doing when you go back to refer to it later. But for this example, I'm gonna use commenting to disable parts of the code so that we can keep them around for reference later. So I've added a slash slash to the beginning of our line one here, which is printing out the uh, statement one. And because that's been removed, if we try to execute this, there is no code that will run because the only code that we have here is commented out and a comment represents some text that describes the code, but is going to be ignored by the JavaScript interpreter. All right, so the next thing we'll do is console log the number from the example that we talked about earlier, and that is 43. So we'll console.log 43. Note that at the end of my uh, console.log statement here, I could put a semicolon, which is sort of like a period in JavaScript. It ends the statement. Uh, it's not necessarily required, but it is helpful to denote the end of a line. So I'm gonna leave them out for now, but just note that uh, some JavaScript you'll see semicolons and it is good practice to have them in there, but they're not required. So we're console logging the number 43. Let's move on to the next example where we talked about printing out Tony Stark, okay? If we, if we pass in the words Tony and Stark to our console.log statement, we might expect that this will log out Tony Stark. Unfortunately, we hit an error, uh, something is wrong here, and so let's, let's go take a look at this error message that we're seeing in the console and try to uh, decipher this and see if there's anything helpful that will help, uh, tell us how to fix our code. So we see where um, the code is running. It's in index.js, and then we have a colon and a number after it. This colon and the number tells us what line number the, the error is on. So in this case, it's in the index.js file on line three. So if we look at our line three here, we have console.log Tony Stark, and we have a bunch of arrows pointing at Tony, and it says syntax error missing, um, missing closing parenthesis after uh, argument list. And so it thinks that Tony was the argument and that we, we were supposed to like put a closing, um, closing parenthesis there, but it turns out that this, the error is actually because JavaScript doesn't know where the string begins and where the string ends. So the way that we tell the JavaScript interpreter where the string begins and ends is with quotes. So we're gonna add a single quote at the beginning of the string and a single quote at the end of the string. And it turns out that JavaScript works with both single quotes and double quotes. So if we wanted to replace this with double quotes, we could do so, and it would work exactly the same. Um, there in uh, ES6, there was recently um, uh, a recent addition where we can use these back tick style quotes also for strings. So you might see those. So there's like three different, at least three different ways. Um, for now, we will just use single quotes. But something that I wanted to point out is that if you have a single quote at the beginning and a back tick at the end, or maybe a double quote at the end, JavaScript won't know that this is a string. The, the beginning quote and the ending quote need to be the same kind of quote. So you need a single quote at the beginning, single quote at the end. Earlier, we talked about another kind of data type, which is a Boolean. So let's look at how we can log a Boolean value. So we say console.log true, and that will print out true. 
Same with false. Pretty straightforward stuff. True and false represent just like those Boolean yes or no values. Next, let's talk about how expressions are evaluated with these literals. So if we have the number literal 43, and then we use the plus operator, we can add some value, some arithmetic values together to get a, uh, a specific output. So if we take the number 43 and add it to 10, we'll get 53. So what's happening here when we run this code, console.log 43 plus 10, is the JavaScript interpreter will first evaluate this expression. So it will take 43 and add 10 to it and sort of replace what, what we've highlighted here with that resulting value. So 53 will replace 43 plus 10, and then 53 is what's passed to the log method on the console object. So we have evaluated this expression 43 plus 10 to get the number 53. Let's also talk about um, how the plus operator might operate on strings. So if we have the string Tony and we add it to the string Stark, this will, there is no like arithmetic operation that you can do to add the word Tony to the word Stark, right? And so strings, the string type will behave differently with the plus operator. In this case, it's going to take the string on the left and try to add it to the string on the right. So it's gonna concatenate these two things. Concatenation is the linking of things in a series. So we're gonna to try to link together the string Tony with the, the string Stark, and we should get back Tony Stark. So if we run this, we'll see the output here, Tony Stark. Note that there is no space between the first name and the last name. We have Tony Stark with no spaces. So one way that we could add the space between the first and last name is by simply just adding a space to one of the existing strings. Tony space plus Stark. That would give us Tony Stark with spaces in the name. Another alternative, instead of adding the plus directly to the first name, we could add the plus as a third string that we're concatenating together. So Tony plus a space plus Stark. Okay, so these are two different ways that we can um, concatenate strings together to uh, evaluate the name Tony Stark. Sometimes it can be helpful to know the type of object you're working with or the type we're working with. Uh, in JavaScript, it has a really handy built-in function that you can call called type of. So we can say console.log type of and then pass in some value. In this case, we'll pass in one. You can also pass in a variable and this will tell you the type of that thing. So in this case, we're passing in one and JavaScript tells us that is a number. That's fantastic. If we do the same thing, we pass in type of, and we just pass the word Tony as a string with quotes again, um, we will get back and see that this is indeed a string. You see that it is a string. So type of is one of the ways of inspecting your value to see what data type that value is.